is from the Minister of Finance that he wishes to make a statement. Minister. Uh, in compliance with Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make the following statement on the 21st meeting of the North South Ministerial Council in special EU programme sectoral format, which was held at the NSMC Joint Secretariat Offices in Armagh on Friday, the 30th of October 2020. As Minister for Finance, I represented the Executive and was accompanied by the Minister for Education, Peter Weir. The Irish Government was represented by Michael McGrath, Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. At the outset of the meeting, there was a broad discussion on the implications of EU exit and the impact of and response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Council noted the commitments and guarantees agreed and put in place as part of the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration to allow for the current Peace 4 and Interreg 5A programmes to continue until completion and for a successor Peace Plus programme to be funded. These were recognised and welcomed. The impact of COVID-19 on the current Peace 4 and Interreg 5A programmes was noted and Council welcomed the actions implemented by the SEUPB to assist project delivery and the measures put in place to ensure the continuation of programme implementation. It is noted that the Peace Plus programme will incorporate COVID-19 recovery actions and the programme development process is continuing. The Chief, Ex Chief Executive of the SEUPB then updated the Council on the progress of the programme implementation. 96 projects worth €277.9 million Euros have been approved for Peace 4, representing 103.1% of total programme value. 34 projects worth €291.1 million Euros have been approved for Interreg 5A, representing 103% of total programme value. The Council noted that the SUPB continues to facilitate participation in Interreg 5B and 5C regional and transnational and interregional programmes. To date, approximately £16.5 million has been secured by 64 partners under these programmes. Progress was outlined on the development of the future Peace Plus programme. Work will continue in order to deliver an agreed programme. A public consultation will be undertaken to provide for further stakeholder engagement. The Council noted that further discussion with the departments and ministers will be required to reach an agreed programme. The final Peace Plus programme cooperation document will be submitted to both administrations, to the NSMC and to the European Commission for approval. Ministers noted that the SEUPB had produced draft corporate plans outlining the SEUPB key objectives for 2017-19 and 2020-22 and draft business plans for 2017-21. The Council then approved these corporate and business plans and noted the budget provision for each. Ministers noted the SEUPB annual reports and accounts for 2016-18, and these were certified by the Controller and Auditor-General in both jurisdictions and laid before the Assembly and the Houses of the Oireachtas. Ministers were advised that the 2019 SEUPB annual report and accounts will be submitted to the Council and laid before the Assembly and the Houses of the Oireachtas in due course. In closing, Ministers noted the SEUP's programme uh, governance uh, structures continue to operate effectively. The Council agreed that options for an independent organisation review of SEUPB will be considered by sponsor departments and that draft terms of reference will be submitted to the NSMC for consideration prior to the commencement of any review. The Council agreed to hold its next special EU programmes meeting in early 2021. I call Steve Aiken, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, thank you very much indeed. May I thank the Ministers for his remarks and coming to the House this morning to give us a, his briefing on it. Uh, Minister, uh, thank you for, in your presentation, you noted that both Peace 4 and Interreg uh, VA is at 103 per cent. Now, some of us will be quite uh, concerned that the fact that we'll be able to uh, brief a uh, project that is already anticipated to be at 103 per cent. So maybe in your closing remarks, you may make comment on that and how that is likely to come through as well. And indeed, you may ask, indeed, where is the excess funding going to come from? Is it going to be divided up equally between the Irish government, the EU and the United Kingdom government, or what is the issue to do that as well? And I also welcome the remarks you made about uh, progress towards COVID recovery. But as part of the COVID recovery actions, will this uh, amount to additional funding coming to uh, Northern Ireland as part of this process? And if that is indeed the case, where is that funding likely to come from? Thank you. Well, I thank the uh, Chair of the Finance Committee for his, his questions. Uh, it, there is an overcommitment in, in terms of both those, uh, and I think that from our discussions with the Chief Executive of SEUPB, that's based on the, I suppose, the, 
the normal expectation and practice that there's always been uh, an underspend, uh, and so they, they are content that they will manage the overcommitment in terms of, of the final expenditure in the programme without having to seek additional funding uh, to, to uh, supplement that or complement it. Uh, in relation to the, the, the future funding, the, currently for Peace uh, Plus sits at about six hundred and fifty billion. Uh, or 650 million, sorry, if only it was 650 billion, uh, 650 million pounds, or euros, sorry. If there is an additional, and there is a discussion ongoing between both the Dublin and London in relation to this, if there is an additional commitment from London uh, and that kind of multiplier effect of uh, there, that commitment is there from Dublin, uh, London, if they match that in terms of the the percentage of that that they would match, that could take the figure for Peace Plus up to a billion pounds, I think, which would be very welcome uh, in the time ahead. So that, that discussion hasn't concluded as yet, but I do hope that the British Government do come forward and match the offer that has been made by Dublin. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister and his officials who gave the committee a briefing on this last week, which was very, very useful and very informative. Uh, Minister, you state that 16.5 million has been secured to date by 64 partners. Um, can the minister outline how much of that money has came to Northern Ireland? And out of the, the 96 projects for peace and the 34 projects for interreg, can the minister outline how much of that money is forecast to come to Northern Ireland? Well, I would, I would have to get the member the actual figures, and I can ask officials to forward them to him. There is, uh, in terms of contribution, there's a, a percentage worked out between uh, the executive, the Dublin government, and the British government in relation to this and Europe. Uh, and in terms of spend, uh, there always has been this is the, the, the spend is largely in the six counties in the north and the six border counties. Uh, and I, I don't believe that there's anything uh, untoward in terms of the breakdown of all of that. But I'd be happy to get the member the figures for all of those projects. I call Melissa McHugh. Last can Carla August a boy lumps are just boys Yanni Fostel Schneier for Hanya and Ratches. I'd like to thank the minister as well for his statement. Uh, minister, as someone who uh, lives just on the uh, Evelyn Shore on the edge of the border, uh, I'm only too well aware of the significance of SEUPB and the many projects that have been delivered in our own area. Uh, and uh, I'd be concerned, we'll say, for the future. So, Minister, what are the implications of Brexit uh, on the programmes currently? Well, I, I think I share the member's view as, as, as a, a border uh, dweller myself in terms of the, the, uh, the delivery of that and the, and the, the prospect of, of a very significant delivery through the Peace Plus uh, programme which incorporates, as he will know, peace and uh, interreg as well. And I think we always operate on the basis that this could be the last peace programme, and I think we need to ensure that it does have that impact in those border communities in particular where, where, where uh, some of the uh, issues of the conflict were felt and the peripheral nature of both, uh, on both sides of the border of communities are, that they are supported. Uh, and obviously there, there is good work has been delivered, and I look forward to more good work and consultation uh, with, uh, with all of the stakeholders to ensure we get the best possible value and outcome for Peace Plus. The, there is an initial uncertainty obviously caused by the prospect of Brexit, but the guarantees included within the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration confirm the joint commitment from the EU and the British and Irish governments for the continuation of the current Peace for Interreg 5A and for the Success for Peace Plus programme. And these guarantees will allow the current programmes to continue on as normal and be financed from the EU budget until their formal closure dates. The EU, in light of the coronavirus outbreak, have also extended the final declaration date in order for projects to fully spend their allocated funding as some recover from delays enforced upon them. Uh, a financing and administrative agreement which will set out the legal, financial and governance frameworks for Peace Plus and in turn SEUPB is currently being negotiated by the EU and the British Government. I call Matthew Till. Uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister to say a little more about what he just mentioned, that is the, the negotiations around um, finance, the, the financing agreement and the future structures around these. Is there a worry that if there isn't a deal between the UK and EU in terms of a future trade relationship, then the commitments that were made in both the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, many of which in the political declaration have already been cast out upon by certain um, uh, Tory MPs, that there's a risk around some of those structures going forward, and was that discussed at NSMC? 
Yeah, there's always a worry in relation to that, uh, and I think we are right to be cautious uh, because the, uh, the process of, of exiting the European Union has been anything but straightforward uh, with regard to the British government, uh, and, and many things which have been, and this, this goes across the whole uh, issue, that the executive can deal with many things which have been committed to and promised by the British government have been uh, abandoned. Uh, are certainly threats to abandon them at various stages. So while we have these commitments and they were part of that withdrawal agreement and they were agreed to, uh, I think we have to be very vigilant and continue to hold uh, particularly the, the, the British Government to account in relation to them. Uh, and we hope that, that a programme which has delivered so much to communities which were so challenged over many years affected by the impact of partition and then the impact of conflict, uh, that that funding which, which was uh, I think one of uh, one of the key contributions from the European Union to this part of the world, uh, that that funding continues and is able to deliver, uh, that those projects have made such a, a, an enormous difference, both peace and uh, interreg projects have made such a huge difference in the border area that we want to see those continue. But I think we have to constantly be vigilant uh, and keep, uh, keep a close watch on how these things develop. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and his uh, answers thus far. I remain very firmly of the view that Northern Ireland has benefited greatly from its membership of the European Union, and the uh, support uh, funding that has been outlined here is something of a clear example of that. Can the Minister provide an update in relation to the, uh, the replacement for the EU structural funds in terms of the Shared Prosperity Fund? Because we are still waiting for clarity in relation to that, and I think it is an important issue. Thank you. Yes, uh, and the member is quite right that we are still waiting for clarity uh, in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, there is a commitment there to replace like with like from the European Union, but we also were operating on the basis, uh, as was Scotland and Wales, uh, that the, the devolved administrations would be developing the programmes, allocating the money uh, and doing all of that. And that, there's a huge uncertainty in relation uh, to the legislation that's currently passing through Westminster. Uh, casts a very significant doubt on that. So, on two fronts, we have a lack of certainty. Uh, one, we, we have no, no uh, firm commitment in relation to how those funds will be replaced, uh, other than a general one. Uh, and, and we, despite repeated requests, both myself, the Scottish, and the Welsh finance minister have made repeated requests for certainty in relation to that. And a number of meetings where we were to seek clarity on those have been postponed in recent times, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, the, we, we haven't got that certainty, and as I say, uh, we are very concerned in relation to developments in that legislation in Westminster because the, the programmes have been delivered here, and the success of those programmes have been delivered locally by people who know the local issues, who can, who, who can get, uh, who know the communities that will benefit most from these programmes, and can get that support uh, on the ground. Administering these things and allocating them and applying uh, to programmes in Whitehall is not uh, going to work for us, and I, I think scale. Uh, Scotland and Wales have the same opinion, I'm sure equally it's not going to work for them, but certainly uh, we want full replacement and we want the ability to allocate and design the programmes uh, that, that uh, come uh, as replaced to the EU funding. I call Gemma Dolan. Last can, Corrie. Um, Minister, thank you for your statement. Uh, can I ask, will Peace Plus see a reduction in the administrative burden on applicants or projects? Well, I, I think that's, that's certainly one objective that I have uh, raised consistently with the special EU programmes body themselves, and, and they have uh, assured me that they will endeavour to do that. Uh, I think the peace programmes, uh, and I'm long enough about to have been involved in the original peace and reconciliation funding that what was developed uh, and delivered through councils uh, back in the 90s, and I think there was a, a very much an accessibility for that funding to grassroots community projects. And over the years, uh, I, there, I, have, I have done engagements myself uh, over the last number of months with people who work on that cold face of the community involvement sector, and their view is that the funds have progressively become more inaccessible to small and grassroots community organisations, that it almost needs you to be partnered with a local government organisation or some substantial organisation uh, to access the funds. So I think it's important uh, that given, as, as we assume each time one of these programmes comes in, that it may be the last one. Uh, that it leaves a very valuable legacy uh, and accessibility to the program itself to make sure that peace was designed to get down into the grassroots to communities that had suffered as a consequence of the conflict on either side of the border. Uh, and, and it has and a lot of projects done that. And I think we need to make sure that if Peace Plus is the last program that we receive in this, that it gets there. And, and accessibility is something that I will continue to raise with the SEUP 
They will go out to consultation, and so I would encourage all elected representatives and all community groups to make sure that those issues are raised with them as well. I call Pat Sheehan. Thank the Minister for his statement this morning. And I wonder, could he tell us what actions have been taken to, to protect projects and programme expenditure during the COVID pandemic? Well, uh, I think there has been a recognition that COVID has, has caused an interruption in terms of some of the delivery, although not perhaps from our discussion with the uh, SEUPB, uh, uh, perhaps not as much as we had expected it to be. So the, the programmes have rolled on, uh, but the, 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 as I said, the, the uncertainty uh, around that, uh, I think, has been dealt with in terms of some guarantee that the EU has recognised that COVID has had an impact and allowed some, if you like, headroom in that to make sure that spending out, if there was a, an original time frame attached to it, that that, that is now stretched somewhat to allow uh, to make sure that uh, people can spend out if they're genuinely held up for reasons beyond their control. So I think there is a recognition that that has its own impact, although thankfully perhaps not the impact we expected. Uh, but the, there is, uh, as I say, the, uh, the EU have extended the final declaration date in order for projects to fully spend their allocation funded uh, funding, and I think that's to be welcomed. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, officials, for coming to the Finance Department and giving us a briefing on this. Minister, um, as we move, and Brexit has already been mentioned there, and there is that promise of that extra money in order to increase it to a billion pounds, we hear about the consultation as well and how we're going to try and reach that out in, into our community. Minister, are you fairly confident that the British Government will meet their commitment as promised? Well, the, the original commitment was for 650 million euros, and that, that commitment has been has been made. And the, the basis that we're operating on is that that is being honoured. There is an opportunity to increase that, uh, and uh, Dublin has uh, indicated that it's prepared to make its contribution. Uh, that creates a multiplier effect in terms of the British government contribution and contributions from uh, ourselves and the EU as well. So I would hope the key to that is the British government adding to their contribution. I would hope they would do that because I think the overall effect of that is to create a much bigger pot uh, for Peace Plus, um, an extra £350 million, which would be obviously very welcome uh, in terms of the, the communities that can access that funding. So the commitment for the initial uh, amount is there. Uh, what we're trying to do is try and secure that uh, to be expanded on and, and to allow us then to generate a much bigger pot uh, across the board. I call Philip McGuigan. Gar Melgood, uh, last can call you. And can I thank the Minister uh, for, for a statement and for the information that he has brought uh, to the House today? I mean, it's clear from uh, that information and, and the sums of money and, and from what others have said about the commitment and support uh, of the EU to peace uh, and to support in communities uh, right across uh, this island, including in my own constituency. Uh, so I have nothing but uh, support for, for this, these types of programmes. The one issue that, that I maybe would have and, and some of the groups that I would be involved with have is the, uh, the burden on the applications. And, and so could I maybe ask the Minister, you know, is there going to be a reduction on the administration burden for applicants? Well, I, I think we would like to see that. Of course, there's a, there's a very comprehensive auditing process for the EU, as, as you will understand, are uh, very uh, keen on making sure that the money that they have allocated and the, the, the money that they have approved through the overall programme is spent in the way it was intended to be spent. Uh, so there is always that balance between meeting the audited, auditing, auditing requirements uh, and the accountability for the spending of public funds and also making it sure that it's accessible to particularly small grassroots community organisations that, that really are the people I think the initial peace funding was intended to benefit, to bring benefit to communities and areas that previously hadn't received support from government or other programmes. Uh, and so it's always that balance and I've been uh, discussing with the SUPB about how to, how to uh, there is a sense over the last number of programmes that perhaps the balance has shifted somewhat in terms of the burden of uh, bureaucracy in, in accessing programmes. Uh, and I've had conversations with them about how to ensure that we, we get that balance right. Uh, and as I say, they will go out to consultation, and I would encourage all groups 
uh, to come forward with their views in relation to that, because I think we, we, we want to make sure that we, we do get that balance right and that this money gets exactly to where it's needed and will have most benefit. Call Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, just following on from that, because uh, I would like to acknowledge the fantastic work that is done by the community sector in Derry and many of them who access European Social Fund and who are deeply concerned about that law. So in the consultation when you talk about that, Minister, will there be a role for the community organisations in, uh, in Peace Plus programme going forward? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the consultation should be wide and it should be accessible. Uh, and I think all those who wish to have their voices heard in relation to that, who have, who have uh, issues to put or suggestions to make, uh, need to make sure that their voices are allowed to be heard in that consultation. So that consultation should be beginning in the not too distant future. And I would encourage members, in particular those who, who, who have that link to community groups, to make sure that they, if they aren't aware of that information, that they, they know when the consultations happen and know how to access it and get the opportunity to make their case to it. Colin McGrath. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, Minister, in the Executive Office Committee, we met with the 11 councils over the last two weeks, and many of them uh, detailed to us their very serious concerns about their financial stability going forward, delivering these EU programmes. And I welcome the commitment in your statement here that the Peace uh, Plus programmes will continue for the duration of this cycle, but it's maybe not just clear about going forward uh, whether they will have funding. Would you undertake to meet with the 11 councils specifically about their financial concerns going forward to try and ease some of their concerns? Yeah, well, I have no difficulty. I meet, I meet frequently with the councils, and I, I, I've, I've met with, uh, with Nilga uh, and others. But if the, if the 11, uh, generally through Solace, I think some of the chief executives come together, uh, absolutely happy to meet them. The commitment is there. The commitment's there uh, to spend out the piece uh, four and the Interreg 5A programmes. That, that commitment's there. Uh, even with Brexit and all the uncertainties, the commitment is there for 650 million euros for Peace Plus. We want to see that increased. Uh, to, be, to be much more. And, uh, uh, you know, with the previous question from your party colleague, all of the uncertainties that come from Brexit and the negotiations and the posturing and the stands that have been taken in relation to some of these issues, we have to hold to that commitment. We have to be vigilant to make sure that that remains. Uh, but certainly from both the European and the Dublin government side and from the executive, we want to see this uh, commitment being met. We want to see this funding being expanded and being available uh, over the next number of years. And, and I'm happy to talk to council groups uh, about that. I call Justin McNulty. And just a quick note to recognise it is World Prematurity Day and thinking about all the, the mothers families who have experienced the challenges around early birth and uh, recognise the brilliant support of Tiny Life Charity. Um, Minister, thank you for your statements and for coming to the House this morning. Can you provide an update on the current funding um, for interreg programmes? Um, there are concerns amongst several programmes, uh, for example, the Caroline Fortunieri uh, Greenway, the Smithborough to Middletown Greenway, that funding may run out. Can you provide uh, certainty that funding will be provided to see the completion of those projects? Well, the, the, the current programmes are to run their course. Uh, alliance has been made uh, both to make sure that, that they aren't interrupted by Brexit uh, and that they, uh, some, uh, more, probably on the more capital side uh, in terms of interreg, uh, that, that, that those programmes which might have been interrupted by COVID and have had uh, undue delays to them, that the EU have ex allowed an extension of the uh, completion date or the declaration date in relation to that. So the funds, as I was saying, I, I don't think you were in the chamber in the first answer to the chair of the Finance Committee, there is an over uh, uh, commitment in terms of funding, but the expectation is that there always has been an underspend so that they, they are in our discussions, myself and Minister McGrath, with the SUPB at this meeting, uh, they fully expect to spend out the programmes. Uh, they meet, expect to meet all of the costs that they're committed to and all of the programme costs that they've committed to. And, and of course, we want to continue to monitor that in time ahead. But that's, that's the assurances that we were given. And that concludes questions to the Minister on his statement. We are running well ahead of our uh, estimated time, uh, approximately an hour ahead of schedule. Uh, I've been advised.